Hey everybody, today we have a very special guest, Rebecca Parham. She's a really, really talented animator who I found on YouTube for her wonderful, uh, very expressive cartoons. Links will be provided. Rebecca, welcome to the class. Hi, hi everybody. Wow, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Um, so why don't you start by telling everybody a little bit about yourself, how you, you know, what school you went to, how you got into animation, where you're going right now? Well, um, throughout my entire life, I've always been heavily involved in theater. And so when I first started college, I took some theater courses. And though theater is a huge part of who I am, I kind of realized it's not going to pay the bills. And at the same time, I've always been a fan of animation and cartoons. Disney was like all I ever watched as a kid. Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, you name it. And so I figured, well, what can I do to get a job in animation? So we searched around my family and I, and we found Wrigley College of Art and Design. And I got a BFA in computer animation there. And that's a lot of where, uh, a lot of where my experience in animation and, and expression and cartooning really came from. But also a lot of it came from being out in the real world and learning to push yourself and put your own boundaries. So. Right now, I am the CEO of my own company, my own animation studio called Let Me Explain Studios. That's the name of the YouTube channel as well. Love it. <laughs> yes. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm, I'm just running a studio, and it's a lot of fun. You do um, animations for a couple of YouTube celebrities too, don't you? Um, I have done. Uh, I've done a couple of things for certain people, and I'm in the process of doing some. Hush, hush. <laughs> but uh, the the main one that I can think of was um, if anybody knows who Dane Bo is, Dane Bodekheimer. He's the guy who created Annoying Orange, and I uh, he sent me a song called Stuck in an Emo Band, <laughs> and I listened to the song, thought it was hilarious, and so I did an animated music video. So you can also look that up and see a lot of where my early work in Flash came from. Because funny thing is. That music video was the first time I ever opened up Flash. Whoa. Yeah, so... I didn't even I had know that was done with Flash. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm using what I can. I mean, I would love to, to <clears throat> one day have Toon Boom, which is another kind of Flash-related program. But, yeah, mostly my work in Flash is what I, what I do nowadays. So your background, in, in, uh, your background is in uh, computer animation? Uh, mm -hmm. Do you mean like 3D animation? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean Pixar, DreamWorks, all that stuff. So, and I do have I do have a thesis out uh, from my school called Bottled Opera. You can see that on my channel as well. Yes, I I love Bottled Opera, and I will make sure that everybody goes and watches it. It's so clever. Did you actually sing those parts? I did actually. You are so talented. <laughs> well, thank you. I wonder um, if one day you'll do your own singing princess musical to rival Disney's. Well, that that would be a very interesting endeavor for me because I just I love breaking the the rules of you know the princesses and the female stuff and the female stereotypes and whatnot. So that would be a lot of fun. Well, Kickstarter. Oh yeah. <laughs> so one thing I notice about your animations um, is that they they're so expressive. I, I, I told you before we started recording that you remind, your work reminds me of Ren and Stimpy as far as like the extremes, the emotion, the, the, uh, the, the, the expressivity of it, but without all the really gross awfulness and surreal plot lines, like you actually have a cohesive funny storyline that I like. And I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about um, why you're so expressive with your emotions in your in your animations. Not all cartoonists go to such lengths to, you know, do more than just a little blipping mouth when they're trying to deliver a punchline. You go that extra length to draw those extra expressions. Well, mostly it's about effectiveness. It's about communication. I mean, there's always been this age-old age -old question about what is art, and to me, art is communication, and animation is communication. You are communicating a story, or if you're a comic book artist, you are communicating something specific, a specific thought that a character has in their head, or an emotion that they have, and you only have one drawing to do that. So you have to be clear 
about what you're trying to convey to your audience, or your audience is not going to get it. And the farther you push things without breaking them, then you can get a more effective feel to your audience. Because I could just draw a smiley little happy face with, you know, two dots, a little thing, and that's like, okay, that's happy. But then if I were to draw a character going like, that's that's just overjoyed. And so you you really need to be specific about what kind of emotion you want to portray to your audience. And then you have to be, you can exaggerate things, you can push things. And if there's a punchline that is very specific, like if it's an angry punchline, you don't just go, well, I'm angry. You go, I'm angry, you know? So... <laughs> So you, you can't just, you know, have a character just sit there, do nothing, go, I'm angry. That's very doll-like and robotic and very ventriloquist puppet. <laughs> we don't want that in animation. That's boring to watch. It is boring to watch. Um, absolutely. It almost sounds like you have classical theater training. I, I do. Like I said, um, I started my... Ever since I was six years old, I've been in theater. I've been performing in front of people, and I spent all high school. I spent a year in college theater in a very, very serious college program in theater, and so they took themselves very seriously, and you really had to understand the material you were working with. You, you spent a lot of time examining scripts and understanding what the character is thinking, what their motivation is, how they feel at this specific point. And you really overanalyze these things so you know what you're trying to convey to the audience. And that, that translated perfectly into animation. I can't tell you how much of a, a jump theater gave me in animation. Wow, that's wonderful. I'm always encouraging uh, people in, uh, in, in web, which is a communication medium, to get hobbies in side projects that also deal with a form of communication, like creative writing or theater, or stand-up comedy, or c cartooning, because these things, the, these other fields, they do so much to help cross-pollinate and uh, enrich the messages that we bring to people. It's, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it prevents inbreeding. So, and you, like, after a while, I feel like in web design, a lot of designs start to look and feel the same. And this is the same in any industry. Like in certain uh, in certain circles in theater, a lot of the acting can feel the same, or the screenwriting can feel the same, or the creative writing can feel the same. Like how many knockoffs of uh, of um, <laughs> Twilight do young adult authors need to write before we move on to something else? So going outside of your field can help you bring something extra in, and it really helps your work stand out and makes it richer and more strong. It, it reinvigorates uh, the stories that people have to tell there. So yeah, fascinating to see that you're bringing, that, you're bringing theater uh, with you to your work in animation. Now, another thing I, I've been talking with the students about is uh, readable poses. This is something that I don't see mentioned a lot in books about uh, comics drawing comics specifically, but I see it mentioned quite a bit in books on animation. Uh, why don't you talk to us a bit about the importance of readable poses in a layout? Well, readable poses in animation is either described as staging or silhouettes. And staging is actually one of the 12 principles in animation as described in this lovely book I like to call the animation Bible. It's called the Illusion of Life by Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston. They are two of Disney's nine old men, and they laid down the framework for basic animation that is still followed today in 3D animation and traditional animation. And staging essentially suggests that if you could black out in a character in its pose, like for instance, let me show you a picture of Donald. Donald Duck. Donald Duck. He's right there. Now, if you were to black out that pose of Donald Duck, like if you took a, a Sharpie marker and blacked him out, you would be able to understand what is going on in that pose. And that is strong staging. It is good silhouette. And for instance, if I were to have a pen, let me see. If I were to have a pen and I wanted a strong staging pose, I would pull it out away from my body and have a good angle of my hand to show that this is a hand holding a pen 
next to a person. So this person is holding a pen, blacked out, that's what it reads as. But if I were to hold this pen in front of me, you wouldn't be able to see that pen, you wouldn't be able to see my hand, and that's bad staging. The shadow that you cast has absolutely no indication that you're holding a pen. You could be holding anything, or nothing exactly. at all. Exactly, exactly. So, that, and if we can, if you think back to, say, Dumbo, for instance, Dumbo. There is a scene where there are clowns in a tent, and they are completely silhouetted. But at the same time, you know exactly what is going on in that entire scene, because there is good staging going on. There is good silhouette on those clowns. Because, and every single pose is readable. And that's good. That's a great example of good staging. And it's used all the time in graphic animation, graphic design, and understanding negative space versus positive space. So, and just having a good strong pose anyway helps communicate your expression a lot better because expression is not just in face, it's in pose too, it's in whole body. Absolutely. So, yeah, so that People is. People act with more than just their eyes and their mouth. Absolutely, especially in animation, especially in comic books. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's bas the, the basic elements of good staging and good silhouette. I would like to recommend that students watch Dumbo again because it was a depression era, uh, depression era movie that was made on a very tight budget. They wanted to actually turn a profit off of it, and it was one of those few Disney uh, movies that actually turned a tidy profit in its first showing and didn't have to be mined for IP to finally start showing a return on investment. But a lot of corners were economized or cut, and yet it still told a really good cohesive story. It might have been partly down to Bill Pete. Bill Pete was an illustrator who worked for Disney at the time and he was heavily involved on the product, on the project. And he, if you read any of his books, uh, he did a lot of golden books and such, and you'll see a, a lot of these principles being shown in his illustration work and he brought it over to the story of Dumbo. So it's a very economically told story that wastes absolutely no screen time. Whether or not it's politically correct today, that's another story, but if you look at it from a storytelling perspective, this is an example of how one can tell a neat and tidy little story with as little expenditure of effort as possible. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, another good question. Um, now, when it comes to emotions and emoting and drawing people, uh, where can't you skimp? Like, there are places where you can economize uh, with your effort. For instance, say you're drawing while someone's talking or an event is happening and you're trying to get down as, as much of what's being felt at that time, enough of that story is what you're, uh, you can at that time. What corners do you cut? Well, in basic drawing, I mean, if, if, if that is the scenario that we're going with, in the case of you just need to get a drawing out, as quickly as possible when someone is talking to get a point across. There's a thing called gestural drawing in a sense of it looks very, very rough. It looks very, very slap dash kind of thing, but it gets the point across. It gets the pose across. It's the expression across. It's done very, very quickly, but it still communicates what you need it to. In fact, I have something. Yay! Share times. <laughs> Share times. I have this lovely little book that I picked up in Disney World. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and here we go. It is called A Disney Sketchbook. That's it right there. Ooh. And and here is an example of a gestural type drawing in which the, the artist has drawn Meriwether. And now that's a very, very quick, very rough, type drawing, but it absolutely communicates her pose and the expression that she is trying to portray. And that's, you know, a very common thing that we use in animation. And that comes back to taking figure drawing classes when you're trying to learn what, uh, how the human body works and how the human body needs to be drawn, and you got to be very, very quick and things out very, very quickly. So not every drawing has to be a perfectly detailed drawing. You don't need to draw every wrinkle on the face. You can simplify shapes. Um, you can break things down to their most basic form. And 
also, if you wanted to stylize design and, and make things a little more simple, I have another thing. This is a book called Creating Characters of Personality by Tom Bancroft. And oh, here wow. we have and here we have examples, say, of a realistic lion. Okay. Now, yeah. That's and a great so, looking lion. I know. So in a case of if you wanted to simplify a lion and make it easier to draw and kind of skimp on the drawing, as we say, we can make him a little more stylized, a little more cartoony. We can push that to even like Hanna-Barbera standards. So skimping it comes in many, many way, shapes, and forms when it comes to drawing. But just understand that not every single drawing you do needs to be completely refined, completely detailed. It just needs to get your point across, basically. Yes, yes. Something that I think a, a lot of people forget when they are first learning how to draw or trying to get better at drawing is focusing so much on the details that they never really, uh, never really dig into the, um, the, the tougher parts, like the hand-eye coordination between seeing something and capturing that moment on the paper. You have to get very fast and very good at controlling your hand while not looking at your paper, glancing down and looking back up. It's a very coordinated activity, and it's not one that people use if they have a photo on their desk and they're staring at the photo and drawing a tiny detail, looking back at the photo, drawing another tiny detail, and then it all looks somehow misshapen when they're done. Drawing is a lot more about yeah. capturing emotion and then going in and adding details afterward, if at all. Well, and it's also about just getting the basic form down and getting the base the basic structure of a drawing down like instead of focusing in and drawing someone's face first you want to get a great line of action you want to put in where their head is going to be where their rib cage is going to be where certain things where the certain body parts need to be placed without without you know putting in extraneous detail, you know? Right. Is that an example of a uh, line of motion there? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. A line of action is very, very useful. Yeah, line of action is very, very useful. It's how you basically decide which way an arm is going to go, if the character is bending, if their spine is bending back, or if it's bending forward. forward. Or if they have something in their hand, that's going to complete the, the line of action. Gotcha. And, so, yeah. Okay, wow, yeah, line of action can make a, a big difference when drawing people, even in seemingly static poses. You know, just turning to get a cup of coffee involves turning, and that is a, a line of action. Right, right. So let's see. Now, we've talked about all the fun stuff, and you've given us a lot of great advice and insights, but I bet someone out there is thinking right now, that you probably have had your own trials and tribulations in breaking into animation. And we all know that art is an ongoing process. No one's ever finished. Uh, you may become better and better, but you don't get called a master until you write a book and you die. <laughs> so what is, what's your biggest hurdle to um, learning how to draw people, uh, their emotion, their expressions, and their, their lines of action? What was your biggest hurdle? Well, I would have to say it's really pushing through that juvenile stage. Juvenile and I call it, stage. Yeah, it's the juvenile stage because it's, it's the period of time, and it can be a very long period of time, it can be years almost, where you draw things and they're not very good or it takes you a long time to draw things and the poses are static and there's not a lot of weight or depth to them and you just don't like it and nobody else is saying oh it's great and wonderful except your mom but it's it's a, it's a period where you just don't feel like you're that good and getting through that stage and pushing through that stage and just getting drawings out and pushing for improvement is how you get out of that. And I would say that that was probably the most difficult stage to go through. And that's probably, and that's how it is with any sort of activity that you're going to try and pick up, whether it's singing or ballet or football or whatever. You're going to go through a period of time where you're not that good. And you, if you really, really want something, if you're really, really passionate about gaining the skill, then you just keep pushing forward. And I will say there is, there is this 
there is a saying in the animation industry, and it is, you have 10,000 bad drawings in you, and you must get them out as soon as possible. And that is very, very true. <laughs> That's great, great advice. I wonder if in web development we could say you have 10,000 bad scripts inside you and you have to write them all before <laughs> you can start writing good code. Um, well, you just have to get them out as soon as possible. <laughs> So, so, all right, my advice there has always been for people like, um, you know, to, to, to get through that stage has always been that you should ask for feedback wherever possible. And you should try not to take it personally. You should try to separate yourself from your work because it's not like this thing that's growing out. It's not like we're in aliens and it's like a creature growing from your body and it's going, you know, to hatch and take over the world. It's, nobody has art like that. You know, it's, it's not going to hurt you if somebody hurts it. Um, so it's important for you to separate yourself from your art, learn to take criticism and look at your art objectively so that you can get better. Because when you treat your art like it's a baby, you're always protecting it and yourself and you're less likely to look for ways for it to improve. Uh, do you have any recommendations as well for people when they're get pushing through that tough time where they feel like all their work is shit and they pr should probably give up? Recommendations as to how to get through that yeah, stage? like what can people well, do to like, you know, get better, push through, uh, and uh, improve in general? Well, art school is one thing. Because <laughs> I'll tell you what, Ringling forced me to get really good, really, really quickly. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a story real quick. Oh, we love the first, stories. The first day I was at Ringling, I sat next to a fellow computer animation major, and I was like, "Oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, yeah, it's so great. We're gonna be in CA together, computer animation." And so she starts doodling, just randomly, like mindlessly doodling in her sketchbook, and she was doodling Disney quality animation like perfect keyframes and I just looked at her and I was like what the hell am I doing here I can't compete with these people so it was it was crazy and it was so intimidating and so scary but I'll tell you what you have to for one have confidence in yourself and you have to understand that you are in your juvenile stage and it's just going to take practice and Three, you have to not be intimidated by people who are better than you, but instead draw inspiration from them. One of the best things that I did for myself was I would look at a piece of artwork, and if I liked it, I would try to see what I liked about it. What was new about it? What was something that this person was doing that I was not? And then I copied. I tried to emulate it. I tried to see if I could do what they were doing. And it's really a case of just pushing your own creative boundaries by looking at people who, who their boundaries are far beyond yours. And so I'm not, ex I'm not exactly copying the Ren and Stimpy guy, but I am using a lot of the same types of elements of exaggerated animation to create my own unique style. But you're drawing a lot fewer hairs on scratchy bottoms while you're doing it, which I appreciate. <laughs> That's that's yeah. That's my own that's my own personal taste. It's like try to find that 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 space between too much and not enough that you personally like and then make it to your heart's content. Wonderful advice and the perfect note for us to part ways on. Rebecca, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come talk with us. It has been a pleasure. Oh, it's been an honor. I I I've been, it's been a lot of fun. Wonderful. Yeah.